Here we are, David Perel and Ana Lorena Fabrega, and we have something new today. See, we're trying to make the show fun, and we listened to the earlier ones, and we were like, you know what? Not as fun as we are, so we're switching it up today, mm -hmm. and we want to keep it just as engaging from an ideas perspective, but also to just make it fun and goofy, because this is what happens. We go on and we're on video and then we're like, you know what? We're way too serious. And then we get off video and then we're laughing and we're goofing and we're honestly, we're just like kids. So we're trying something new today. Anna, drum roll, please. Your turn. <laughs> okay. I'm very excited. So today we are actually incorporating a new tradition to our show um, and it's called show and tell. Um, as probably many of you have heard this term before, it's very common in schools, um, but in case you haven't, show and tell is when the teacher opens it up to the students and they bring an object or an item from home um, that represents something in their lives or that talks about something or, you know, an opportunity for them to share something personal so that others get to know you better. And kids love this. Like, they can literally go for hours if you don't stop them. David, you and I are going to have to find a way to do it quick um, to the point so that we can then continue with the show. But we, the way we want to do it is something that kind of is related to the topic that we are going to be discussing today. So, David, why don't you go ahead and start? What is your show and tell item? Okay, so... It's sort of a double item. So this is a bus <laughs> that I made. It's a ceramic bus. And it says, it's called, I called it the cookie bus. I the, cookie it the cookie bus? bus. Uh, yeah. So then when I was a kid, I really liked the logo of the United States Postal Service. So there it is. I, I... just love this logo. Sort of a bird. Now, the cookie bus <laughs> comes with something interesting. So my mom is a hoarder. She doesn't throw anything away. So what she did inside of the cookie bus was she saved all the tickets from things that I went to as a kid. So this was World Series 2006 baseball ticket. But this game never happened. So I got a ticket to the game, but it never happened. And the World Series, biggest game in baseball. Then here's a flight, Chicago O'Hare to Madrid, and it was, this must have been like two, 2010, 2010 right here. <laughs> All right, wow. this stuff never ends. Arizona Diamondbacks versus Atlanta Braves. This was a, a trip that I did with my mom, and they literally just go on. Like <laughs> it just goes on. <laughs> forever oh my so god so many tickets so that is all my childhood trip. is in my hands it's and now on the floor <laughs> and now on your lap. that is amazing i love that show and tell item that's very personal i love it i there love it <laughs> okay put that away before your mom gets upset if she watches this yeah, she's gonna get mad <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome well i'm not where I usually live for the quarantine i've been for three months in this other apartment far away from where i usually live so I kind of had to get creative, but then I found something that's perfect, um, especially for what we're talking about today. So as you know, I had a very atypical school experience growing up, right? So I had to move around every year or every two years. I had to go to a new school. So I went to 10 different schools. I was always the new girl. And, you know, I, I, I talk a lot <laughs> and that obviously <laughs> helped me making friends. But then there was there was these countries where I moved to where I didn't speak the language. So, for example, when I moved to India, I didn't speak. Uh, I went to an American school, but I didn't speak English yet. And then when I moved to Brazil, like I didn't speak Portuguese yet. So at the beginning, sometimes talking wouldn't help. So, you know this, David, but I love playing games. And I found this one game. It's called Jacks. I don't know if you're familiar with it, David. It has a little ball, and these are the jacks. No? Okay. So this game, my mom taught me when I was very, very young, she, um, and I would play a lot with my sister. It's a very simple game, um, and you don't need to talk, right? So 
whenever I would go to a new school, um, I had to figure out, well, how am I going to make friends? How am I going to introduce myself? And what am I going to do? And I would always go with this specific game to the different schools that I went to. Um, I also had other games, but this one in particular was interesting because I could teach it without having to talk. Um, so people would pick it up pretty quickly. Some people were familiar, some people weren't. And, and everyone liked the game. Like even my teachers would play with me and you can play with one person or you can play with many people. So it was always a good game to have with me. And then when I became a teacher, um, I was like, well, my students are obviously going to be familiar with this game, right? And it's incredible, the generational gap. When I introduced this game, they were like, they had never heard of it. And um, they were not really interested at first because they're so used to like all these different like interactive games. But then when I taught the game, they all loved it. So every single class that I had when I was teaching were obsessed with this game of Jack's. And I don't know, it just reminded me of, of, you know, something that, well, one of the topics that we're going to discuss today, which is what do schools actually get right? Or what is something that we, we actually take away from school and that we use today? Cause we, you and I talk a lot about the things that schools get wrong. And, and then this game, um, kind of like reminded me that, one of the things that I did learn in school is like how to interact and get along with people that are very different from me, right? So you spend so many hours in a classroom for so many years with 20 plus kids, that's 20 plus personalities. And, and it's, you know, you're in a small room and you have to do all these things, projects, and then just interact. So you really have to learn how to live with people that you may not love, um, some people that are maybe very similar, some people that may not be very similar, some people that are not nice. And you need to figure out a way to get along or at least survive, right? Um, so something that I did learn was like how to figure out how to connect even with those people that were so different. And through games was a way that worked really well for me. David, what's something that you um, remember from school that you actually use today or that you think that schools get right? Yeah, yeah. well, I've been thinking a lot about memorization. So I think that in some ways memorization is really good and in some ways it's really bad. And so rather than just saying one, I'll sort of like walk both lines. So if you look at chess players, they've done some studies of chess players and they can look at a board and their brains just light up when they see a board that is similar to what they've already seen before. And they can look at a board and process that board extremely fast. And it's a kind of memorization where, like, the knowledge almost f flows and subsumes into your body. And through that, you can become super competent. And I think that anybody who is really good at something, they've sort of, like, even gone beyond memorization. It's like it goes memorization and then internalization. And they'll just look at a complex system and they'll know exactly how to process it and get through it. Like, I have a friend named Adam. And he's an advisor to different hedge funds around the world. One of the smartest people I've ever met. He has a life title with the United States Chess Federation. And that is very hard to do. Um, he trained with Bobby Fischer right before he won the World Chess Championship. And they were training together. Like, smart guy. Yeah. And what he can do, and like we'll talk about chess and investing, same sort of thing. He can look at markets and he knows exactly how to look at how gold is moving, exactly how to know what the metal traders are doing, and exactly how to look at interest rates. And we'll look at like three variables can, and can just figure out markets very intelligently. And I think that like that is what we want out of memorization, to have knowledge be so absorbed into us that we know it well. So I think that that's good from school. I think that school and the way that it teaches us to understand information at such a deep level is something that I actually think is kind of underrated. At the same time, though, there is a lot of school that is memorization for the sake of memorization. Mm -hmm. And right, it's always like when you're in math class and you can't use a calculator or you're writing some kind of English paper and you can't go back to your notes, it's kind of ridiculous because life mm -hmm is an open note test mm -hmm. and i think that way more tests in school should be open note so it's funny because mm -hmm. i sort of see both sides of this like i think that memorization is undervalued when you can actually internalize what you're saying and it's overvalued in terms of how we make people memorize things because i know me i just have a terrible memory and so 
I didn't do well on a lot of those tests. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I think that maybe what you're saying is that um, some memorization is good and also depending on the strategy that you're using, right? Because you can develop strategies to memorize things in ways that make sense to you. But what's really difficult and it's what usually happens in school is that there's a disconnect when kids are trying to memorize. It's just like memorize, memorize, and they have a really hard time remembering things. But and then also the fact that there's so much memorization and not so much of connecting the dots. So I think that maybe if they had like more of a balance between those two, then then it would be more suited for different kids. I like that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share one more. But even but on. even to like mm -hmm. go back to memorization, I'm going to find one of my tickets. So, <laughs> for example, like memorization. So this is the one I was looking for. So there was uh, there were a couple years where the Warriors played the Celtics. And this was when mm -hmm. I was just a huge Warrior fan. And I know, like, I still remember from this game, Baron Davis hitting the game-winning shot, and it's been 14 years. Like, it's been 14 years, and I still remember it. And so I think that when you actually, like, subsume what you're doing, like, there's this great quote that we only know what we make, and I think it, likewise, we only know what we experience. And because I experienced this and the salience of memory is tied to emotion, because I had such an emotional memory around this, I remember it. And so memorization is a byproduct of other things, but it in school, we too often try to make it the thing. And when we do, we lose the forest for the trees. Yep. But you know what? I think there's a difference between memorization and you remembering that because mm. I'm not good at memorizing things like I'm like I literally cannot memorize a phone number just for some reason like things that are at the moment like combination of numbers together really quickly I forget I need to write it down otherwise after five seconds I forget but I have a very good memory in terms of experiences like it, like sometimes people are like how do you even remember that that was so long ago and for some reason when it's a vivid experience I do remember but when it comes to memorizing facts that are disconnected or you know history facts or like I don't know multiplication facts at this point of course I know them I was a teacher but those kind of things that are just memorizing for the sake of it those are harder and I think that that is what school mostly focuses on when it's comes to memorization um, rather than ex like providing experiences that make you remember kind of like what you just said. Yeah, well, that's interesting because the thing is, the question is, can you experienceify facts? So if you know that you're good at memorizing experiences, how do you then take facts and put them onto experiences? And you said something that was disconnected facts. And that's what you don't want. Like, so Elon Musk has this great answer on Quora or on Reddit, one of them, where somebody asks, how do you learn stuff? And he says that he pretends that knowledge is like a tree. And first you have to go learn the trunk of knowledge and then mm -hmm. you can focus on the branches and then you can focus on the leaves. And what he's seeing is that in any field, there's like eight to 12 things that you might need to know. And if you know those things, then you can get everything else. And what you said about disconnected facts, I think is the problem that if we don't have the tree branch, how are we supposed to remember the leaves? Because they can't actually hang on anything. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. Um, David, why don't you explain to us what is on learning? And then we're going to talk about that second part of, um, of our show today. Yeah. So I think unlearning is very difficult because once you, let me explain this like this. So there is, I had a conversation yesterday with a guy named Adam Bernstein. Okay. And one of my favorite writers is a guy named Peter Bernstein. And when I was on the phone with Adam, like I've now associated the name Bernstein with the name Peter, not Adam. <laughs> so at the end of my call with Adam, I said, thanks, Peter. And I hung up and totally embarrassing. But the problem is I have already absorbed into this crazy brain that Bernstein should be Peter, not Adam. And so I totally embarrassed myself. And I think it's very hard to disassociate mental representations. And the way that this applies to school 
is we are trained to be dependent on the teacher Mm -hmm. to know what we should do. We are trained to follow the syllabus to know what we should read. And we are trained to look at other people, other students, to know how we should act. And the real world, in terms of how it promotes entrepreneurship, in terms of how it promotes people who are go-getters and self-starters, in terms of how it helps people who are good with white space creativity where there's no lines to draw in between, trying to unlearn the things that you learned in school is extremely difficult. And Mm -hmm. when I look at people who are entrepreneurs, generally, when I look at people who are creative, they are people who never even learn the things that school is trying to teach you. And that's why they can do it. And so just like me with Adam, Peter, Peter, Adam, who knows? What's hard is trying to unlearn some of the bad things that you learned in school, first of all. And second of all, as the world changes... the way that you have to think about building a business, the way that you have to think about connecting with people, the way that you just have to think about life is being inverted and transformed by the internet. And that is why it's easier for young people who never learned the pre-internet ways of doing things to actually succeed on the internet because older people have to unlearn certain things before they relearn them. So their intuition steers them in the wrong direction. Exactly, exactly. And we've talked about this before. Um, There are a lot of things that we learned in school that we've had to unlearn um, in order to do the things that we do today, right? Um, and and I want to talk about that a little bit. So the first one that comes to mind, and and this one, you know, I had to unlearn, especially when I became a teacher, is this idea that in school they teach you that play is kind of the opposite of work, right? They tell you, okay, you need to work really hard and then you can play, right? If you do all these things, then you can go and have fun. And it's always like separated, like work and play. And then I've had to unlearn that because if you think about it, like work, I mean, play is not the opposite of work. Play is actually the way that kids work, right? And and not only kids, like no matter what age you are, I feel like when you play with ideas, especially with new ideas, like it really helps you understand them better. And with kids in particular, it's almost impossible to separate learning and play. Like they're, it's almost like they're woven together, right? Like play enhances learning. Play reinforces whatever it is that you've learned. It is how kids begin to use what they know about, you know, the world or in a real way. Like that is what makes sense to them. So in or, like instead of trying to separate it and see it as two different things, see it as something that has to go together in order to achieve the most learning, at least with kids. And I know that this is something that you and I do really well too. Like you and I work together, we talk all the time, we're always in this, but we always incorporate that play element and we actually see work. I mean, we always joke that what's a Saturday and what's a Sunday, right? Like, like we don't really have weekdays. We don't really have a schedule because we really like what we do. And of course it's not always fun and games, but we do try to, you know, we enjoy what we do and we try to see it like play. And that's something that I really like about working with you. So that's something that I've definitely had to unlearn. And I think that many people would benefit if they start to see it as one thing rather than as two different things. What's something that you've had to unlearn um, from school? Yeah. Before answering that, I really like where you were going with this. And I think that if you try to be creative, you won't necessarily have fun. But if you try to have fun, you will be creative. And I, whenever I try to make things, try to start with the idea of having fun. It's the same reason why in the writing course I teach, I encourage people to just write about the thing that is bringing out their energy today. And... I've experimented with so many things and this gets into the unlearning. Like I think a lot of school overstructures us and Mm -hmm. it tries to say there is a method to do these sorts of things and you have to follow it. And what I've learned about teaching and implementing methods is you want to implement as little as the method, as little of the method as possible. So why is that? You want to implement some of the method so that you have some structure, so that you can follow the knowledge that somebody else has already created and Mm -hmm. build momentum for yourself and do something repeatedly. If you do something repeatedly, 
you basically need a method, at least at a <laughs> consistent mm-hmm. enough pace. With that said, adding too much method and you lose your soul, you lose your humanity, you lose your individuality. And so what school does is we just keep adding to the method. So Mm -hmm. often the individual, the first instantiation of the method is really good, but then it becomes this tyrannical system where I have to follow instructions. I have to follow protocol. And the problem with that is a method that is too rigid and too structured is oblivious to human hormones, to human emotions, to the highs and lows of life, to the ways that we rise and fall with our passion. And I've had to unlearn that. I have a very strict method in terms of working out every day, in terms of writing for 90 minutes a day. Those are non-negotiable. But Mm -hmm. within that, I can do whatever exercise I want. I can write about whatever I want. And adding any more structure is just going to take away my energy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you know what? Um, that is exactly one of the other things that I've had to unlearn. Like, David, have you realized that creative work looks nothing like the linear step-by-step process that you find in most schools? Like, creative work is, you know, non-linear. Like, it takes time and, and there are pathways and, and you kind of, like, deviate and then you come back to it and you need you need you need to spend some time doing it in order to, for your ideas to float. And in school, it's kind of like you're going from one subject to the next and it's 45 minutes or 50 minutes that you really never get to get into that creative flow. And then on top of that, and this is something that, you know, again, we, we, we spoke about this when we talked about creativity that I thought, you know, that I was not creative growing up. And then one of the biggest things I've had to unlearn related to that is that in school, they expect kids to be creative and learn sitting down, and being quiet, right? In school, like you don't really have a lot of room to talk. And as you know, (laughs) I love to talk. I need to talk in order to organize my ideas and to get those ideas flowing. And I need to be active. I need to be moving. Like I cannot think or produce anything sitting down, being passive and just writing, for example. And you, you realized this quickly and you were like, Anna, From now on, creativity, using your voice in your feet. I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how you get your ideas flowing. Logic in your knees with your hand. And that's when I get my post-its like a kid and I start putting things and I'm using my hands and I'm getting my ideas going. And then writing is with my fingertips in front of the screen, right? But, But that's what works for me. And in school, like I just couldn't. I, I was like, why can't I learn or why can't I produce anything? It's because I, I can't do it sitting down and I can't do it being quiet, right? Um, so, and this is kind of funny, like two weeks ago, my mom called me and she said, she she showed me, she, she called me on FaceTime, a note that she found, she's cleaning the house and organizing the house because they're moving, a note from a teacher in Mexico that wrote to my parents. And I mean, this was very typical, like, you know, again, Anna can't stop talking. Like, we don't even know where to sit her anymore. Like at this point, she's isolated in front of the room and she's still talking dot, dot, dot to herself. That's what the note says in Spanish. And it's not that I'm crazy. It's not that I no. it's just that I, that is the way that I would process things and and that I would, you know, organize my thinking. And so I had to talk. So you can imagine how hard it was for me to be in school. You are definitely like the teacher's like, who is this psychopath? Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) And that's the kid that has ADHD and that's the kid that does this and that. And it's like, no, that's just, I just have a different way of learning and I am very creative. You're just forcing me to produce in a way that is not natural to me. And to be honest, it's not natural to most kids. Like that's why so many teachers complain about behavior management and why can't the kids sit still? It's because they're not meant to sit still. You know, Mm -hmm. we have so much. and, And I say we, as if I were a kid, oh my gosh, kids are so energetic. Like they just have so much in them that they need to keep moving. So if you walked in my class, it, you know, at first thing, when I was teaching, it would look like a mess because you had kids literally sitting on a desk, like sitting on top of the desk. You had kids standing up and reading, like literally standing up and reading. You had kids on the floor with their pillows, like laying down. And that was fine because I, I realized for me that would have worked. I would have produced so much more had I had the flexibility to to you know, sit wherever I want, stand up when I needed to. And, and it worked for me. It may not have looked like work for some from from an outsider who's used to thinking that for kids to learn they need to sit down and be quiet but they were learning and they were enjoying what they were doing 
So that's definitely something that so, I've had to unlearn. So how did you know as a teacher what students were slacking off and which ones weren't and what students were actually learning stuff? Because what we do is we associate the act of sitting with mm -hmm. the brain going. It's like mm -hmm. this weird assumption that we have that the quieter the body is, the louder the brain must be. But what you're saying is, no, both of them can actually work in tandem. But in your classroom, if you saw Mary sitting down and Alice standing up and Mary was like on the pillows, just like chilling, lying down, and then you saw Alice running around, how did you know which one to actually focus on? Okay, well, the first thing that I wanted to say is that I quickly realized that kids quiet looking at you are not paying attention 90% I'm you know I, I could say that 90% of the kids that you see quiet going like this and looking at you they're daydreaming they're expert daydreamers like they are long gone like I would rather for them to be doing something you know rather than this because when they're like this they're not really paying attention like kids just they're not paying attention when you see them like that so if, if you if I walked into a classroom and I saw a bunch of kids looking at a teacher like that I'm like I don't know how much learning is going on there, you know, but what I did was that I, I was very, so I would set the expectations very clear from the beginning with my students. So I would be like, you know what, I'm, I'm very flexible, but you know, you, you know, I, I'll show you what the right thing is and I'll show you what we need to do in order for a classroom to flow and for learning to happen for you and for everyone here. And I will, I trust you until you give me a reason not to, that's what I would always tell them. So what that meant was if you tell me that that works for you, you know, standing up and reading the book, that's fine. But then if I go and talk to you, because what I would do is I would conference with the students walking around the room one by one. So if the student was in the floor, I would lay in the floor with the student. If the student was standing up, I would stand up next to the student. And I would just chat to see like what the student was doing and just kind of like to see what they were learning. So I was like, if I do get to you and I see that, you know, clearly you're playing around and, and it did happen, obviously, then I am going to choose where you're going to be sitting. Right. But I always gave them that choice first. And what they did was, you know, a few of them at first would kind of try it out and then they would notice, OK, she's giving me the option. But then if I don't do the right thing, then she's going to choose for me. They would quickly pick it up and it would work. You know, in general, it would work. So. So, yeah. So I realized that by walking around and talking to them, you, you pick up on the kids that are not doing anything and the ones that that are engaged in their learning. It just looks different. Awesome. Well, that's a that's a good place to wrap up. I have mm -hmm. I have tickets to clean. Okay. All of these. All I loved our tickets. show and tell. And in fact, we're going to be calling this going forward the show and tell, right? Because it's related to school and the topics that we talked about. I mean, it's not like we talk about school all the time, but about education in general. So go ahead and clean your mess, David. Booyah! And Pick yeah. a card, any card. Thank you. Chat soon. Thank you. Chat soon. <laughs>